Thank you, Rachel, and uh, thanks to Harvard Bookstore for hosting this event, and thanks to all of you for being here. So I thought I'll uh, open up by uh, saying a few words about uh, you know, how we came to write the book and just uh, tell a few things about the book and, uh, and, and then uh, open it up for, for questions. Uh, James and I uh, met almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, actually, I'm not sure whether our first meeting uh, went off the right uh, sort of start. Uh, he was giving a seminar at the LSC where I was a student at the time, and I think uh, he sort of thought of me as the obnoxious guy in the, uh, in the audience asking questions. Uh, but we sort of uh, later on hit it off, and, uh, and, and, and shortly thereafter, we were sort of, uh, we started talking, and, uh, and we realized that we had a lot of uh, uh, research interests, almost passions in common, but they sort of differed from what was the uh, uh, general focus of economics at the time. We were both interested in economic development, but with a uh, decidedly political angle. We thought that not only political dynamics were important to study, but that those political dynamics were crucial for understanding the patterns of long-run development and why some societies uh, perform differently than others. And that led to a uh, collaboration, a very close collaboration for uh, almost 18 years, uh, uh, which led to several academic papers and to a previous book that Rachel mentioned, which was a more academic book. Uh, and, uh, and around uh, four or five years ago, we started feeling that it would be a good discipline for us to put our ideas in a sort of a more unified context and try to make it also accessible to a broader audience. Uh, it was both a challenge for us to sort of uh, bring uh, ideas uh, in a more holistic manner, extend them, uh, try to understand the history of uh, several places that, uh, that hadn't featured in our research, uh, and also, uh, also sort of make it accessible uh, to a general audience, which I think is, uh, which we think is the, is, is, is the ultimate aim uh, for, for this type of endeavor. Uh, and uh, so, so Why Nations Fail is the, uh, is the fruit of uh, those uh, years of labor. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, the best way of sort of giving you a, a few clues about the uh, ideas and the thesis in the book is to sort of first mention how the book differs, uh, how our thesis and vision differs from what's out there, and then uh, tell you one historical episode that sort of illustrates uh, uh, how, uh, how we view the world and, and, and why we think this perspective actually has more legs uh, for explaining the, uh, the large uh, swaths of history and, and also uh, the world as we move forward. Uh, the question of why some nations fail economically and others prosper has been one that uh, many of the leading philosophers of social and social scientists have written about over, uh, over centuries. Uh, but uh, many people uh, today, when they write about this topic, uh, fall back on uh, a number of ideas which we think are not very, very helpful for understanding the big picture patterns. Those would include geographic factors. Some, uh, going back to Montesquieu or even Machiavelli, would argue that uh, climate or soil quality or natural resources or disease environment are crucial for understanding uh, whether a nation prospers or not. Uh, but in fact, when you look at uh, several uh, key historical episodes, the opposite uh, is often the case. Uh, Many of the areas that are very wealthy today were once very poor, and uh, geographically, places that we think today are disfavored who are among the richest uh, in the world. So that would include the Caribbean, it would include many parts of Latin America, the Indian subcontinent. An idea that's even more uh, popular than the geography view is culture. So. Uh, at the end, uh, many academics and non-academics would come back to culture and ultimately argue that uh, cultural factors are important for explaining long-run economic performance. So they would argue Haitians are poor because there's a particular Haitian culture that's uh, inimical to work, or Africans are poor because of certain African beliefs or certain Af African cultural values, or Latin Americans perform differently because of some sign of Iberian uh, cultural attributes, or they would argue that ch the Chinese are very wealthy or getting very wealthy because uh, 
of some Chinese or Confucian values, let alone the fact that the Chinese with the same culture, the same values, were languishing in poverty just, as, uh, just a few decades ago because the institutions uh, uh, that they lived under, under the dictatorship of Mao, were very different. And perhaps even more uh, popular among academics, especially among my economics colleagues, uh, would be a sort of a leadership view. Uh, they would claim that uh, nations prosper when they have enlightened leadership, which means leaders who have the right idea about what sort of policies to adopt, or they have the right advisor, or they listen to the right advisors, which is often the economists that, uh, that are my colleagues. And, and some other nations don't have the right advisors, or they're stubborn, and they don't prosper. And uh, that also is not very helpful, because when you look at uh, many, many examples in history, Countries do adopt policies that are against economic development. They block economic development. But they don't do so by mistake. They do it on purpose. And that's where our theory comes in. They do it on purpose because enriching a nation is not the same as looking after the interests of the people who are in power. The people who are in power are often going to look after the interests of a narrow elite or are going to uh, to adopt policies and arrangements that are going to keep themselves in power. So our thesis is that the things that make a nation rich are actually not very complicated. They are what we call inclusive institutions, the sort of arrangements that encourage investment and innovation and create a level playing field so that the talents of the society at large, pretty much everybody in society can be deployed. But inclusive institutions are the exception in history and even the exception today. Instead, uh, all around us is what we call extractive institutions. The name extractive institutions is uh, meant to create this image, which I think uh, we, uh, James and I think is, is the right sort of image, because they are institutions that have been designed to extract resources from the majority by the, an elite, by the few. And these extractive economic institutions don't exist in a vacuum. They are supported by extractive political institutions. And the extractive political institutions are those that concentrate political power in the hands of that elite and allow that elite to use that power in an unrestricted and rapacious way. And these extractive institutions emerge and stick around precisely because, as I've just mentioned, they look after the interests of the elite, even when that doesn't further the economic prosperity. And economic prosperity occurs when societies develop, finally break out of the uh, close of extractive institutions into inclusive institutions. So what I want to do next, briefly, is I want to talk about a particular historical episode to illustrate what I mean by this, and also why the sort of geography, culture, or enlightened leadership ideas are not going to get us very far in some of the most telling examples. If you want a laboratory for economic development, perhaps the best one is the New World, the Americas. Because the institutions in the Americas have been shaped in the last 500 years by European colonialism. And they do differ quite greatly. We have uh, the sort of institutions that developed under uh, European colonialism, plantation economies, slavery in the Caribbean, parts of Brazil, and other parts of Latin America. You have forced labor, encomienda, uh, very hierarchical organizations. And you also have a sort of the beginnings of democracy in North America that developed into much more of an inclusive direction over the last two centuries. So how did these different institutions come about? Was it because of geography? Was it because of culture? Perhaps the uh, English brought a different culture than the Spanish. Was it because of some sort of enlightened leadership? Some people had a better vision of what sort of society would be more durable. And I think if you look at the history, it's none of these. If you look at the history, the sort of factors we emphasize, the politics of institutions, emerges as the most important one. I think the best way of thinking about this is to look at one of the expeditions, start with the, one of the expeditions that the Spanish conquistadors organized. Uh, shortly, uh, uh, more or less around the same time as Cortes was, uh, was conquering uh, the Aztecs, Juan Diaz de Soles uh, started the conquest of the southern cone of Latin America, so South America. Uh, so he went around what is today Uruguay and Argentina. And he encountered, uh, just like Cortes and others did, some civilizations. But the civilizations he encountered were quite different than the Aztecs or the Incas. They were much less developed in some way. They were more sparsely settled. The, uh, the uh, native populations that were called uh, Guerani and, uh, and the Charuas uh, 
they were much more uh, mobile, essentially hunter-gatherers, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the conquistadors had a vision of conquering those places, getting gold and silver. There was no gold and silver, but actually much more important for them was to enslave people and put them to work so that they would produce food for them, they would produce goods for them to export and sell and enrich themselves. But the sparsely settled native populations were not very easy to capture. They were sparsely settled. They were very mobile, and when captured, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't work. Uh, they weren't used to working, uh, doing agricultural work. So the Spaniards uh, starved for a while. They, uh, they were clubbed to death. Juan Diaz de Solis himself was killed by one of these uh, uh, native Indians. And uh, they, they conquered very interesting places. They founded uh, the Buenos Aires. But they had no interest in the good airs of Buenos Aires or the kind of the fertile land around it that would become the basis of Argentine boom in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. So they essentially retreated from there, moved up the uh, up river, up the Parana River, and they moved to what is today Paraguay. There they encountered another band of, ba band of uh, native populations, but those were a little uh, different. So the Guarani were a little more settled. They were already sedentary. And more importantly, perhaps, they, uh, not only were they uh, more densely settled, but they also already developed a hierarchy, a social hierarchy. There were elites and uh, princes and princesses. So that made it much easier for the Spaniards to take over those institutions. They uh, killed some of the, their leaders. They married the princesses. They took over the hierarchy. And they forced the Guarani to work and, uh, and produce food for them. And the extractive sort of institutions that would later uh, persist in the area of Paraguay were founded. And of course, that uh, strategy of colonization was very, uh, very well perfected by Cortes and Pizarro in, much, in a much more brutal manner in the, in the conquest of the Aztecs and the Incas. So what about North America? Did the, uh, did the English start the colonization of North America with very different intention, with very much more humane uh, and, uh, and forward-looking manner? The answer, I think, is no. And about uh, uh, six or seven decades after, uh, about seven decades after the, uh, the, uh, the Juan Diaz de Soles, uh, the, uh, the Virginia Company, under the auspices of the English crown, uh, started the Jamestown colony. The Virginia Company was itself very hierarchical. Uh, it had its own captains, governors, and elites. And they had a very clear mandate. Their strategy was exactly the same as that of the Spanish. They wanted to go there, get silver and gold, find the Indians, uh, or the native uh, populations, and enslave them and get them to produce, for, uh, to produce for them. But actually, they faced exactly the same situation in, in Uruguay and Argentina. Uh, they. Uh, they were, uh, they, there were only sparsely settled, very mobile uh, native populations. They couldn't uh, capture them. They couldn't put them to work. And exactly like the Spaniards, they started starving. It was only by luck that uh, some of them survived. But in contrast to the Spaniards, they didn't have the option of moving upriver. There were no Inca empire. There was no Aztec empire. There were not even the Guaranis in the area. So the Virginia Company came with an alternative strategy. They said, OK, we cannot capture and enslave the local population. OK, we bring our own lower strata. So they brought the indentured servants with the idea of creating a system that was very similar to the manorial feudal system that had already disappeared in England, where they themselves would be the elite. And these people that they had brought would do the production at very low wages and under coercion. And, uh, and they, would, uh, they would enrich those elites. And I think. Uh, just one little thing that I will read from the book is the laws that they passed uh, in the context of this new strategy. So the, uh, the, the governor of the Virginia Company of this Jamestown colony at the time was Sir Thomas Dale, and his, uh, his deputy was, uh, or actually, uh, Sir Thomas Dale was the deputy, and Sir Thomas Gates was the governor. And the Gates and Dale uh, passed the uh, uh, pass these laws for the colony, it reads like the, uh, one portion of it like, reads like this. No man or woman shall run away from the colony to the Indians upon pain of death. Anyone who robs a garden, public or private, or a vineyard, or who steals ears of corn shall be punished with death. No member of the colony will sell or give any commodity of this country to a captain, mariner, master, or sailor, or to transport out of the colony for his own private uses upon pain of death. When you read these laws, two things strike you. One is that this was no happy, shiny colony. This wasn't people trying to set up their freedom. This was a very oppressive situation. Pretty much anything you did was punishable by death. And secondly, 
there was a good reason for this harshness, because Sir Thomas Dale and Sir Thomas Gates were trying to enforce something, as you could actually hear in these laws, that was very difficult to enforce. They were trying to make sure that these settlers, these intended servants, wouldn't go and live with the Indians, wouldn't trade with the Indians, or wouldn't even trade with anybody else, and most importantly, wouldn't run away and go to, uh, op to the open frontier. But the open frontier was there, and it was very difficult to stop them. So the second strategy, despite all that pain of that, was a failure too. So after these two first strategies failed, then the Virginia Company did an about face. They said, OK, this is not going to work. We have to find something else. Just a mere eight years after the beginning of Jamestown, they did something entirely different. They started creating the beginnings of an inclusive institutions. They created the head right system in which they would actually give land to the settlers. And the settlers themselves would start uh, under secure property rights, growing food and other items in order to profit from them. So in other words, they started giving incentives to people. But how could the settlers actually trust Sir Thomas Gale and Sir Thomas uh, Gates? These people just a year ago were trying to kill them for the uh, littlest of the infringement. So these inclusive economic institutions or their beginnings couldn't exist in a vacuum either. So they had to be backed up by a different system of political power. So one year after the head right system came the General Assembly, where political power was transferred from the uh, elites of the Virginia Company to the settlers themselves. So the beginnings of inclusive economic, uh, political institutions. So I think what this story uh, highlights is that there was no difference between the vision the wishes, and even the ways in which, uh, through which they went for between the Spanish and the English. There wasn't some unique thing about English culture that led to the differences. There was nothing about the geography. If anything, the geographically more favored places, at least at the time, were the ones that were more fertile and were supporting already very large populations, like the Inca and the Aztec empires, or perhaps even the Guarani relative to, uh, to the areas around Virginia. And most of all, there was nothing about leadership. It wasn't that Sir Thomas Gale, uh, the Dale and Sir Thomas Gates had better visions, had were better advisors, or had a better understanding of how the world worked. They had exactly the same one as the Spaniards. But they faced different constraints. And those constraints, in particular, in limiting their political power, not letting them, despite all the threats, get their way in terms of setting up extractive institutions, were the reason why the inclusive institutions actually started developing in the United States. And I think this story sort of starts giving you a sense of why these distinction between inclusive and ex extractive institutions is a useful one, and also why the politics of the institutions and how they develop is central for understanding how the economic trajectories of different nations are shaped. Of course, what we do in the book is much more than this. We not only try to explain this contrast between inclusive and extractive institutions, but how they emerge, how they persist, how they shape innovation and growth trajectories, how extractive institutions sometimes are able to be broken and turn into inclusive institutions, and the conditions under which inclusive institutions are or are not able to withstand challenges. For example, something that people in the context of the United States are discussing at the moment. And, and, and when is it that civilizations such as Rome and uh, Venice uh, were able to fall and uh, decline because they're institutions took uh, steps in the wrong direction. But I think uh, that uh, what, I have, uh, what I have mentioned already should hopefully give a little bit of the flavor of the book and perhaps encourage you to read more about it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, probably your definition of democratic capitalism, I think there are many people would define it uh, uh, somewhat different, different people would define it somewhat differently, but probably your definition of democratic capitalism is quite close to what we call inclusive institutions. And I think uh, the idea that institutions do matter uh, for, uh, for, for incentives, which, which you know, you're, 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 you're also highlighting, I think, I think is, uh, is, uh, is, is an important part of the book. I think the, uh, the more kind of challenging part and the part that we spend more time in the book is about why is it that those institutions, if they are good for economic growth, don't emerge in many places? And why is it that they do finally emerge? And when is it that they are able to get consolidated and survive for long periods of time? Uh, so uh, so this, uh, the, the last question is about uh, how authoritarian growth in places uh, uh, such as uh, South Korea or Singapore, or you, know, you could add China, uh, fit with the thesis. And I think that's a very, very important question. 
So uh, what we uh, argue in the book is that sustained growth requires inclusive institutions. Extractive institutions are sometimes able to generate economic growth. It isn't the case that elites, when they control political power, are always opposed to economic growth. If you can manage economic growth in a way that's actually to your advantage, uh, it, is, uh, it is even better. Not only do you monopolize political power, but there will be also more resources for you to control. The problem emerges, and again, which is something we argue in detail uh, in the book, is that in, under many circumstances, elites rightly uh, or wrongly, but mostly rightly, are afraid that uh, economic growth is going to destabilize their power. Uh, so in the cases of that, that you have mentioned, I think, uh, I think South Korea is a very interesting one, because it started as uh, exactly as you've pointed out, as an authoritarian system. But that economic growth and the transformation of society did, in fact, uh, destabilize the system. There were big uh, uprisings against military rule and ultimately bringing democracy. So, uh, so I think that sort of path is certainly one that uh, authoritarian governments are sometimes uh, kind of initiate. And, uh, and in many cases, it will uh, lead to some growth, especially at the early stages. We call it, it leads to what we call catch-up growth, meaning that it is growth based on the import of technology or the use of existing technologies. And the big sort of uh, question that will uh, that that even I think is in the minds of people more than even more than Singapore would be China, because China has been uh, essentially doing that under a very authoritarian system for over three decades and 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 rapidly. So on the face of it, one could say. Well, the Chinese experience is, 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 is a counterexample to this sort of uh, inclusive versus extractive uh, kind of dichotomy. Uh, and, and, uh, and what we argue in the book, so I'll just give a little bit of the, of the details, is that, in fact, uh, the, 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 perhaps the best, uh, the, the best parallel for China is the Soviet Union. So of course, there are many differences between China and Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union also grew at breakneck speed for uh, almost four decades uh, at pretty unseen rates. And you know, when you compare uh, Soviet Union to any other economy, it's a much more dictatorial, it's a much more harsh authoritarian extractive institutions. How was, how, how was it able to do so? Well, it was able to do it for, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with two key ingredients. The first is that it was using a lot of the technology that was already out there in the West. And second, it was using its, the state, the power of the state to forcibly move people from agriculture, which was very inefficient under the sort of the uh, system that had already developed under Tsarist uh, uh, Russia, into industry, uh, which was still inefficient but more productive than agriculture. Even though at the time people were mesmerized by Soviet growth, uh, not only the CIA, but uh, all sorts of academic economists, journalists were uh, were, were, were all woolly-eyed about the Soviet Union. It was the future. It was a better system, and so on. Of course, it was uh, rid uh, riddled with inefficiencies, and it didn't last because it did not generate any innovation. Uh, by the 70s, stagnation has set in, and then the system collapsed in, in the late 1980s. So uh, China has managed something, and Singapore has managed something uh, better than Soviet Russia, because they have already introduced some inclusive elements in their economic institutions. When you compare Chinese economic institutions today to those that, rule, uh, that reigned under Mao, they are in immeasurably more inclusive. In, in agriculture, there is something close to property rights. In, uh, in industry, there are many companies that are uh, entrepreneurial, even the state-owned companies, which are among some of the largest in the world, uh, you know, are, tra are, 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 are trying to enter into world markets. But it is still under extractive institutions, extractive political institutions. And, uh, and it will have, according to our theory, the same sort of difficulties that the Soviet experience had. It's not going to be able to transition from this catch-up growth, uh, which is quite easy or at least quite feasible when you have income per capita one-tenth or, uh, or right now one-seventh of the United States or Germany, uh, as it is in China, where, to an innovative economic growth where incentives, innovation, and the right allocation of talent is going to matter much more. And that's where the China is going to come to a fork in the road where either the system is going to clump down and economic growth is going to slow down very sharply, or the same sort of economic, uh, the same sort of political changes that took place in South Korea will take place in China as well. 
Of course, at the moment, the Chinese Party, Communist Party's grip seems to be firm enough that the first rather than the South Korean path looks more likely. Yes. The way that we define things, and of course, you know, different perspectives are possible depending on both your value judgments and, and, and other things, is that you know, economic inequality is an outcome. Economic inequality per se doesn't make institu uh, an, a system inclusive or extractive. The problem is that there are certain key characteristics that are necessary for inclusiveness. And two that are crucial is equality of opportunity, a level playing field. If you don't have that, you don't give opportunities to a large fraction of your society to take part in economic activities. And second, political equality, so that politically everybody has a voice so that the system doesn't become monopolized and captured by a small minority. So in that context, my biggest fear with economic inequality is not itself, but what it implies. Economic inequality makes it much easier for political inequality to set in. So if you look at it, for example, in the context of the US, we've had a huge increase in economic inequality. But what would worry me much more from the viewpoint of this book and our research is that that has also started being associated with political inequality. The American democracy that was sort of mythically, but also in reality, very open and it listened to the voice of the average person is now viewed as captured by many people. And there is some truth, quite a bit of truth to that, not only because of the super PACs, which is a recent in, in, in invention, but because of lobbying campaign contributions and who actually gets their voice with their senators, congressmen, and the president. And I think that sort of political inequality is the problem. And when you look at historical examples of great civilizations that have collapsed, uh, and if there are more questions on this, I can come back to that, the, the way that has happened, or at least the ones that we have studied, is always it starts with a, from the politics. First, political inequality sets in, and that political inequality starts changing the uh, equality of opportunity, the level playing field, uh, erecting barriers against some people, not allowing them to sell their labor or to do what they want to do, and then economic decline sets. That's something we don't actually uh, tackle in the book. I mean, there are many aspects of Jared Diamond's very interesting ideas we, we talk about, but one important topic we don't tackle in the book, and that's exactly because of what you said, the word nation is about that. We don't tackle you know, the, the very important question of the environmental constraints that we are facing, because that's a global problem, and it requires global solutions. Uh, and, 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 and our more, you know, we talk a lot about current events, but, uh, but, the, but the sort of the future is not, you know, we don't make projections for the next 100 years and so on and so forth. But the ecology is, is an alternative view, which, you know, for example, Jared Diamond, not only in his collapse, but in his even more famous Guns, Germs, and Steel, has sort of advanced ecology as an explanation not only for humanity, but also for why some parts of humanity have done better than others. Some parts of civilization, subcontinents, and so on and so forth have done better than others. And that we spend quite a bit of time on that. And, uh, and Jared, uh, Jared is a great scholar, great writer, and a good friend. But we disagree that uh, that the sort of ecological factors that he emphasizes, for example, availability of certain species, certain uh, domesticable animals, uh, or the uh, or or some geographic factors are, are 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 really very important. So we go back a little bit to the Neolithic Revolution, for example. Perhaps one of the most uh, commonly accepted uh, examples of a ecological change, uh, and we argue, uh, based on a lot of anthropological research that others have done, that in fact it was mostly due to an innovation in institutions. It was not the fact that people suddenly domesticated uh, uh, species and became agricultural, but it was first that they first made uh, institutional innovations and started building hierarchical organizations that made some people the elite and some others uh, uh, servants to them, and that, lead, that, that, that was in the context of sedentary people. And once the sedentary people and those societies started emerging, that's when the division of labor that led, that opened the way to agriculture uh, set in. Yes, so uh, for us, you know, there, uh, we, were, we were away, uh, we were somewhat uh, worried that this title would m make one think of failed states, which is a very important problem. But at the end, we decided it was well worth the risk because to us, it is a failure that a place like Mexico is not as rich as the United States. 
There is no state failure in Mexico, okay, except for the drug gangs. It's not Somalia, it's not Haiti, it's not Afghanistan. It is a failure that uh, in South Africa, for example, before apartheid, 90% of the population were in great poverty, and South Africa wasn't growing despite a lot of uh, uh, resources, a lot of possibilities in terms of industry, commerce, and agriculture. So even if the state doesn't fail, it's a it's an important failure not to take advantage of the opportunities to prosper. But we also argue in the book, and that's, uh, that's something that we do uh, towards the end of the book, that what is defined as state failure, the collapse of the state authority entirely that leads to some sort of chaos in places such as Somalia, what's happening now in uh, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, uh, Sierra Leone, where it, where it ha or Liberia, where it happened with the Civil War, is intimately related to extractive institutions. Because extractive institutions not only create an elite that's able to uh, extract resources from the rest, but they also make it very attractive for other would-be elites to fight to come to power. And that infighting often spills into civil war, leading to the collapse of the state institutions entirely. The question is, how does a society make the transition from extractive to inclusive institutions? And unfortunately, and this is, uh, this is to, the, to the disappointment of some, the book doesn't come with a recipe for policy. If, if people want a sort of a five-point plan that you want to apply in uh, Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Africa, so that you can check the list and you can start improving institutions in, uh, in, in a particular place, we don't have that. But still, we go through a lot of examples of how extractive institutions have turned into inclusive institutions. And I think there are a lot of generalizable lessons which we try to draw in the book. And essentially, there are two paths. One is a more gradual path, and the other one is a more revolutionary path. The gradual path is best exemplified by what, ha what happened in the 19th century or you know, even before, but especially 19th century England and Britain, uh, where the threat of revolution, the uprisings that came at the beginning of the 19th century were met by the elite, not with force. They tried that, but they quickly moved away. But with the extension of rights, extension of franchise, but gradually, step by step, just enough to appease people, but the conflict uh, ebbed and flowed, and there were more demands being made, and those more demands led to more rights. And that's more or less what happened in the example that I mentioned in the United States, for example. When the settlers uh, wanted more rights, uh, and they started running away, the elites rather than really implement this upon pain of death and kill all of them or try to kill, of them, kill all of them, they gave in. In Australia, the same thing happened. In Australia, there was, it was a penal colony. There was a very harsh environment, uh, and the elites were, uh, were, were, were set on using the full force of the military in order to, uh, to keep the sons and daughters of the, of the convicts in place and keep the penal colony as it was. It didn't work. People rose up. There were some battles. There, were, there was a lot of conflict of some sort. But at the end, they gave in. So that sort of gradual path, when available, is the best. Because it doesn't lead to, it leads to a peaceful transition. But unfortunately, in many situations, the elites, when faced with the threat of, uh, with, 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 uh, with, 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 with demands, don't give in to the demands, but retrench. In the context of, uh, of, of the most recent events in the Arab Spring, we can see the whole gamut of these things. In Tunisia, for example, although there were some clashes, it was, the, it was a reasonably peaceful transition. In Egypt, we saw there was uh, an attempt to use the security forces and the military to suppress the uprising. But uh, ultimately, there was a, uh, although there were, there were a lot of uh, lives lost in the process, there was a a rupture within the elite. The military abandoned the Mubarak and, uh, and, the, uh, and the groups are allied around the Mubarak, especially the NDP party uh, and, and, and some of the other elites. And, and there was a transition that was semi-peaceful. But in Libya or Syria, where the elites thought that they could actually ride the storm, and especially when they thought that none of the elites saw a way out for them in the same way that the military saw, thought in Egypt, fine, we can give up Mubarak, but we can still hang on to power, and they've been fairly successful in being able to do that, the, the cars were much more in favor of, uh, of, of going for repression. And in such situations, for example, as we have seen in the context of the French Revolution, for example, or in, uh, in uh, 
in, 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 in Tahrir Square as, uh, or in the Arab Spring, as I have just mentioned, a more radical and more revolutionary change is inevitable. And the problem with revolutionary changes, unfortunately, is that just like the French Revolution, uh, much worse, just like the Bolshevik Revolution, they, have, uh, they lead to a lot of bloodshed. And just like the Bolshevik Revolution, there is a danger that they might actually bring a worse government than the one that they're replacing uh, to power. So, uh, but, but unfortunately, there is no recipe for ensuring that there will be gradual change and the elites in power are going to give, give up power in a peaceful manner. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, actually the origins of this book for me was in my childhood. I grew up in Turkey. I was there until I was 19. And, uh, and, and many of the sort of the questions that formed the basis of this book were really the things that, uh, that, that, that I was obsessed with was, uh, when I was in my uh, uh, late teens. You know, I saw the repression around me. It was a very repressive environment. There was a military coup in, uh, in 1980. Uh, uh, very few freedoms. Uh, being a minority of any sort wasn't easy in Turkey at all. And Turkey was a dysfunctional economy. Uh, you know, it's been doing much better over the last 10 years. Uh, but those sorts of things were the, were the first, uh, uh, first impetus for me to ask questions why Turkey was different from, you know, uh, other countries that I was uh, reading about. And then you know, I started reading about Latin America, you know, what was similar about Latin America and Turkey, you know, that were thousands of miles apart. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, Ataturk's reforms, I think, uh, uh, they were a two-edged sword. Uh, in, at some level, you know, they, uh, they, they were the end of a very repressive, very backward regime, uh, the, the Ottoman rule, that, uh, that, had, uh, that had set up extractive uh, institutions not only in, in Turkey but throughout the region. Uh, so, for example, if you want to think of the history of Egypt that we were just uh, uh, mentioning about, you, you, you know, we talked this, about this a little bit in the book, you cannot do so without thinking about the Ottoman rule and how that collapsed and so on. Uh, but, but Ataturk didn't bring inclusive institutions. It, he modernized Turkey. He brought uh, industry and he brought some important elements uh, that would be associated with inclusive institutions. But he also brought a particular sort of uh, new elite to power uh, uh, around him. And he also empowered the military very strongly, just as in Latin America and some other parts of the world. And, uh, and a lot of the conflict within Turkey over the last several decades has been with that between that elite and the people who have always felt excluded from power in Turkey. And uh, you know, sometimes people refer to them as the white Turks and, uh, and the black Turks. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is that, uh, you know, when the institutions are weak, improvements take the place of two step forwards, one step backwards. So uh, the, the economic institutions have improved a lot. The, uh, Turkey now is economically much more powerful because the, uh, the world doesn't just uh, revolve around the big business uh, conglomerates in Istanbul. Now, all through the country, there is a lot of economic activity. But now the, the, the groups that came to power uh, you know, taking away the power from the military did so under a different ideological banner. Uh, and, and, and that anti-militarism is being used in a very harsh way to persecute journalists, uh, freedom of speech, and so on. So, so in some sense, uh, there is a danger. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not inevitable yet, but there is a danger that you get rid of one elite, but you bring in, uh, in its place another elite who will also act rapaciously unless the institutional forces to restrain power are there. So that's why what's important is not so much who is in power, that is important, but it is political equality. It's important that when the uh, current Justice and Development Party is in power, people who are opposed to it also have a voice. Now that voice is being silenced in the same way as the military totally silenced uh, the voices of people who were opposed to the military rule. You know, the way to think about this is that income, what you extract in terms of uh, goods is only part of the equation. So I think there was no money in the world that you could have paid to Saddam Hussein to bribe him to leave power peacefully. Because he not only enjoyed the huge wealth that he had built, but he enjoyed totally dominating society, having whatever he wanted be implemented as the law and the rule and, uh, and, 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 and his wishes. So in the same way, you know, Stalin did not hugely enrich himself. Uh, he did not have a big Swiss bank account. But he totally dominated society, and he ruthlessly persecuted all sorts of uh, or source of opposition. Of course, you know, when we have evidence, the evidence is that almost all uh, of the elites have been even uh, more, uh, more clever uh, 
than Stalin in enriching themselves. When you look at North Korea, the uh, archetypal you know, communist regime surviving today, the elite in North Korea is, uh, is, 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 is hugely prosperous relative to the rest of the country. They have access to the l latest luxury goods. Uh, uh, you know, somebody uh, used imports into, uh, into North Korea to, uh, to, to estimate the uh, annual uh, cognac and whiskey uh, consumption of uh, 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 Kim Jong-il, and, and it, was a, uh, it was a huge, uh, huge number. So, uh, so, so, so I think, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's useful to think of it not just as, uh, as, as the income that they get, but, but, uh, but generally more, uh, more broadly how they dominate society. But you raise another interesting point, which is, you know, take somebody like Mugabe. If he was cleverer, perhaps he was a better demagogue, could he save himself by reinventing himself as a developmental dictator? Could he do, you know, what Deng did in China, or what Jiang Zemin did, in, uh, or Bismarck did in, in, in Germany? And I think the, uh, the answer is I don't know, but the, the problem is that, you know, although we think of Mugabe as the regime, he's not the regime. You know, there are many other people in the military in Zimbabwe as there would be in North Korea. Even if the uh, Kim Jong-un today wants to change North Korea, he won't be able to because there is an elite and other elements of the elite would realize that they would be sidelined with the changes. So that's why change comes somewhat slowly and when there is a sort of a consensus within the higher echelons of the elite. And for example, we're seeing that in Burma, after the first generation of or the first two generations of the of the military dictators, you know, uh, are uh, are gone now. Uh, a sort of a new generation who actually thinks that they can manage a transition without losing their power, without being persecuted themselves, are starting a, a process of opening up. Yeah, I mean, of course. I think uh, I think the U.S. Uh, U.S. gives the example. I think of how. It could start. I don't think I, I, some people will say, you know, U.S. is already a failed uh, state. It's not. I mean, we, you know, United States is still the 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 the, uh, the 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 most innovative economy in the world, but it has it has uh, it is showing uh, a slide uh, in its institutions. And and I think uh, the way I would say it is that let's think about another economy, another nation that has failed uh, similarly. And 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 my favorite example would be Venice. So between the 10th and the 13th century, Venice just was just like the United States, the most innovative economy in the world, a relatively open economy by its times, unparalleled inclusive institutions. It reached this uh, uh, economic uh, and military power by, develop, by innovating it, it, uh, and by trading. It was a trading nation. It was very innovative. It developed not only new ways of uh, new, new shipping methods, but it also developed new contracts that enabled better risk sh sharing between uh, people investing in uh, lo uh, long distance voyages. And those sort of uh, contracts enabled people to take risks and, uh, and, and expand the Venetian trading empire. And it was also exactly as, uh, as, uh, as, as, as a theory that I've been uh, developing uh, here uh, suggests, it, it had uh, relatively inclusive political institutions. It wasn't, uh, the political power was not in the hands of a, uh, one person or a, simple, uh, or a group. It, it had its own parliament. Uh, uh, it had uh, the parliament or a subset of it. The, the great council uh, elected the doge. Uh, the doge was uh, accountable to that council. It had courts, it had laws, it had appeal courts. Uh, but what happened is that at some point, the people, a uh, subset of the people in the Great Council said, well, why, are, why do we allow other new merchants and young people to come into the Great, uh, great Council and share political power with us? And they closed up the system. They said the Great Council from now on is closed. Only the people who were until now members of the Great Council can become members of the Great Council. Once that happened, political power became very monopolized. The political inequality set in. And what happened next? What happened next is that Venetian uh, elites started banning the sets of institutions that had underpinned their growth. So the Comenda, for example, the contract that enabled the risk sharing and, and led to the growth from the, from the 10th century onwards, uh, was a great innovation that was banned. It wasn't allowed because why? The Comenda actually allowed these young merchants to enter and compete with the ventures of the, of the members of the Great Council. So I think that's exactly the sort of path that I would be afraid about, which is that 
you actually create political inequality. And with politi by political inequality, I mean that political system becomes monopolized in the hands of a few. And those people start calling the shots. And they start, uh, uh, they start then choosing policies in a way that looks after their interests at the, at the expense of society. And I think that concern is not you know, unique to us. So let me just uh, read one other quote from the book. Uh, and this is from a president of ours. But it's not a current president. It's a president who wrote 100 years ago, Woodrow Wilson. And he says, if monopoly persists, monopoly will always sit at the helm of government. I do not expect to see monopoly restrain itself. If there are men in this country big enough to own the government of the United States, they are going to own it. So I think that is the problem. The problem is not economic inequality per se, but economic inequality creates people, men, big enough to own the United States government. Yeah, great question. This is not something we talk about in the book uh, at all. Uh, but let me give you, for what it's worth, my, uh, my quick answer. I think on the whole, you know, the European project has been a huge success. I mean, you know, look at Europe uh, in 1945. It's a wasteland. And it's been a huge success, and it's been a peaceful success. It's been an innovative success. There's been a lot of innovation, some of it by important technology, but, but, uh, you know, but with a lot of innovation. And the European project you know, was mostly a political project to avoid uh, war within Europe, to avoid, uh, to, avoid, uh, to avoid these deep historical animosities that you've mentioned. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think it, as a political project, it had some economic costs. And I think lately, those economic costs have uh, somewhat increased. And, and, and people are showing some unwillingness to, uh, to be the ones bearing it. And I think the politics of it is very important. Uh, I just wrote a little article with Simon Johnson arguing that you know, uh, a lot of the problems of recent problems of Europe would have been much more lightly past if uh, there were earlier and more radical restructuring of debts of countries such as Greece, Portugal, and Ireland that are blatantly unable to pay those debts. But that didn't happen partly because of political reasons, because uh, you know, there was a general view pushed by the banking system, which has a lot of political power within Europe, that if those debts were restructured, the banking system would collapse, and those collapse would uh, bring the European economy to a screeching halt. And I think that was exaggerated, and it really delayed all this entire restructuring. And, and as a result, the problems deepened. But I don't think the problems are, 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 are as fundamental as the sorts of problems that you know, uh, countries like Sierra Leone or Liberia or Nigeria are facing. So, so still, you know, Europe. Europe has problems, but, but it's still a success story of the last 55 years. Yeah, I think it is for the following reason. I mean, you know, the, another word, you know, all the words in this title, you know, I, uh, somebody asked about the word fail, and we were worried about fail. And we were also worried about nations, because, you know, it creates the image of a nation state, whereas we talk about, you know, societies way before they were nation states. We talk about Rome in the book. We talk about Venice. We talk about city states, the Maya city states. Uh, but still, I think nation is the right imagery for the following reason. If you were to talk about civilization, for example, it, it brings the image of a sort of a shared culture that's important. Whereas what we are talking about, a nation is the, is the right sort of concept for that, because it defines the borders over which institutions and political power is exercised. The nation is the unit that nation may be a city-state, over which somebody rules and has the political power to rule. Sometimes, of course, uh, even, even, e even the elites don't have that capability. And again, one of the things that we talk about in the book are, are societies such as Somalia or Afghanistan, where the national state is so weak that there is no law and order. And there, you know, almost the nation uh, functions as if it consists of sub-nations or tribes that don't trade with each other, that don't have jurisdictions over each other. And that's, of course, uh, another recipe for economic failure. No, of course, of course. Uh, and, and we don't mean to sort of uh, belittle the importance of such things as social norms. You know, what's a, what's a constitution? You know, it's not worth the paper it's written on unless people believe in it. But we do emphasize the uh, difference between institutions and culture in order to 
sort of uh, argue against the stories, the theories that emphasize certain cultural attributes that are at the root of economic success or failure. Going back, for example, to Max Weber, some people emphasize religion. You know, the Protestants uh, have a, a certain set of values that are good for economic growth. The, the Confucians uh, have a set of values, or the Muslims have a set of values that are bad for economic growth. And, and, and we sort of try to go through historical and other evidence in the book to suggest that those sorts of cultural explanations are not going to get us anywhere. But certainly social norms and people's beliefs in institutions are an important part of it. Out. We do actually in the book, and I, I didn't go into the details, when we define inclusive institutions, we define two, two elements of it. You know, I only emphasize one of them here you know, for, for inclusive political institutions, the pluralism distributing political power equally. But centralization is also important. So I hinted at that in, in response to the previous question, uh, that you know, you're not going to have uh, a set of institutions that encourage uh, innovation, investment, secure property rights in a society like Somalia where there is no central authority whatsoever. So some degree of centralization is important, but then political equality and openness of the political system uh, or constraints on the exercise of political power are the ways to balance it. So, so there, there, there is probably a little bit of intersection here with what you're saying, but what you're saying is another interesting direction that certainly would be for somebody to develop. One final question. There are examples in which the cultural factors don't seem to have played much of a role. But I think you can probably find examples in which they do seem to play a role. You know, one that we discuss and, and we sort of argue the importance here was due to sort of pre-colonial tribal institutions, but somebody else might argue perhaps it was some other cultural factors, is Botswana. So Botswana started out as one of the poorest countries in the world when, upon independence. It had a few miles of paved road. Almost nobody had uh, graduated from high school. And, uh, and it became the fastest growing country in the world. And it did so by first developing democratic, uh, inclusive political institutions. And how was it able to do so while all other, uh, pretty much all other sub-Saharan African societies, uh, you know, uh, created a different set of extractive institutions following colonialism. And I think there were a number of factors. One of them was that Botswana uh, had a unique historical uh, episode, uh, a unique history which, uh, in which it had, uh, differently from many other uh, African polities, a, a sort of already the beginning of inclusive pre-colonial tribal institutions. Second, again uniquely, even though it was a British colony, the British had no interest, so they didn't actually destroy or even meddle with those uh, tribal institutions, and so they survived. But then, uh, also, it was lucky. It was lucky that uh, instead of Mobutu or Mugabe or Shaka Stevens uh, or uh, Charles Taylor, it had a leader, Saret Sekama, who seemed to be uninterested in, uh, in, in building personal wealth and... Uh, and, uh, and and, and instead were really wanted to build a durable democracy. So why was that? Well, Saret Sekama had, uh, was, uh, was the son of one of the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the ruler of the largest tribe in the, uh, of the Swana. So perhaps there was something in the values of that tribal thing that encouraged Saret Sekama to do that. I don't know. So that's the sort of thing that we say that was, uh, that was the luck that they had a good leader rather than one of the more rapacious leaders, but that luck would not have, you know, served anything unless it was kind of combined with lots of historical and institutional uh, background that, that enabled that. Thank you. Thank you.